So now we're ready to go. All right. So hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, this is a new experience for me. I'll make a confession. I've never given a talk this way before where I can't see my audience. So we'll see how it goes. Um, I hope you enjoyed the last couple of talks. I know we're probably all really getting exciting, excited about gardening season. I was in the grocery store yesterday and I saw that sea potatoes were out. So that's a good sign, even though it's snowing tonight. Uh, but tonight I'm going to talk to you about controlling weeds without chemicals. And just a little bit of background on me. I am a weed scientist, um, and I'm, but I'm also a gardener. I've been gardening for about 30 years. So I'm going to talk from the perspective of both a weed scientist and try to weave in a little bit of weed biology and ecology. And I'm also going to weave in some experiences that I've had over the years. And in this picture, I'm sitting in a garden that I had when I was a grad student. I gardened in a community garden and it was kind of neat because there were people from all over the world there and I got to see a lot of unique and effective things and I also got to see a lot of disasters that we could all learn from. So um, I'll be talking about both those things tonight. So weeds are always a challenge for gardeners. And in particular, organic gardeners contend with many weed problems because they can't use herbicides. But in general, I would say that most home vegetable gardeners, whether they are strictly organic or not, are probably going to rely mostly on non-chemical weed management techniques. And those are the techniques that my research focuses most on and that I'm most familiar with. So I'm just going to go through a bunch of those sorts of approaches with you tonight. All right, so this is something that I saw in the community garden time and time again. Uh, first thing in the summer, everyone would get out there with their tillers and they would till the soil bare and plant their seeds and it looked really beautiful and everyone was really excited about their garden that was going to grow. And then we have the weeds. People go to the lake, they forget about weeding, and they come back in July, and this is what you see. You'll see a big bunch of weeds, and you can barely even see the crop in there. And so this is kind of a disheartening circumstance, and most people don't really want to spend their weekends on their hands and knees pulling weeds. They'd rather go to the lake. And I have some suggestions that can help you control the weeds before they get to this point so that gardening can be more fun and not so much of a chore. Um, but the first thing I want to talk about is the difference between perennial and annual weeds. So this is really important and this is where I'm going to bring a, a little bit of the biology into play. And so um, it's First of all, it's very important to be able to identify the weeds so that you know whether they're perennials or annuals. And if you're weak on your ID, I would suggest getting some books. There's a lot of good online resources. And I'm also really interested in helping people identify their weeds. So if you can take a good picture, you could look at my email address on the NDSU Plant Sciences homepage and send me a few pictures and I'd be happy to try to help you identify your weeds. So the ID is key, but if you know what the weed is, it's good to know whether it's an annual or perennial because the approaches you're gonna use to control these weeds are very different depending on their life cycle. And the reason is that annual weeds generally have long, simple tap roots and can be easily killed by hoeing or hand pulling, but Perennial weeds, on the other hand, often have complex horizontal root networks, and they can't be as easily removed via tillage. Oftentimes, if you till them, you'll break up the roots, and every little piece will grow a new plant. And so you need different techniques for um, suppressing or getting rid of these weeds, depending on whether they're annuals or perennials. Um, annual weeds can be readily su um, suppressed using mulches 
but even the best mulches won't usually stop perennial weeds. That's why you need a different approach. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit first about perennial weeds. And usually when I give this talk in person, I'll ask people uh, to go through these pictures one by one and see if they can identify them. And so on the top left, what we're looking at, you can, you can test yourself as we go along. What we're looking at is Canada, Canada thistle. This is a noxious weed. It's a very nasty character to have in your garden. It can reproduce via underground root. And if you chop up those little root pieces, each piece will make a new plant. Same goes moving clockwise to the top right. This is perennial sow thistle. Um, one good thing that you can do if you're not sure about what a weed is, try digging it up a little bit. And if you see that you have a number of shoots connected together with roots underground, then that's a pretty good sign that what you're looking at is a clonal perennial plant. And you'll need to start thinking about strategies to get rid of that plant that are different than annual weeds. On the bottom left, we have quaggrass. This one, it can make a real mess in your garden, but luckily the roots are very tough and they're not easily fragmented, so you can really yank on it and pull the weeds out of the ground. On the other hand, on the bottom right, we have probably the weed that I'm most afraid of, which is field bindweed. And this is another perennial plant that reproduces vegetatively it reproduces via underground roots, and the roots are very easily fragmented, and it's very easy to spread. And so that's just an overview of some of the common uh, clonal perennial weeds that you might see in this area. So what I've learned over the years is that with the perennial weeds, prevention is really worth a pound of cure. And so don't start, don't plant into established perennial weeds. And I know this is going to sound a little onerous, but you can oftentimes dig carefully to remove these plants, roots and all. Now, it depends a little bit on your soil texture. If your soil is a really heavy clay, this is going to be more difficult. On the other hand, if you have a lighter, loamier, sandier soil, it's going to be really easy to get a garden fork and loosen those roots. Be really careful to follow the roots carefully through the soil and get every little piece of it. And this is something that I have done myself um, on a piece that was about an acre that was heavily infested with curly dock, Canada thistle, perennial south thistle, and dandelion. And over a period of two years with persistent digging to remove the plants with their roots, I pretty much got rid of them. And once you get rid of them, unless they come back in, the dandelions may come back in from seed often, but the other ones mostly spread from roots. And so you can largely eradicate them with some patience in a small enough area. Now, if you have a larger area, you might need to use some other approaches. Smothering with a heavy mulch or weed barrier might work to some extent, especially if when you see little shoots emerging, you remove them immediately. Another approach that you can use is something called solarization, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a, in a second. So this is a picture of a wheelbarrow full of weeds that I removed from one of my research sites, along with that garden fork. And that's a really useful tool for removing those perennial weeds. And so I highly encourage you to just get out there and maybe get a bunch of kids together that have some energy and just try to get rid of some of these perennial weeds physically. And then the other idea is to use a solarization approach. And with solarization, what you're doing is laying some black plastic down on the ground for a season. And you can see in this picture how they've anchored the plastic down with some bricks and stones and maybe some pieces of wood. And um, there's a couple different options for this. Um, you can use 
clear plastic or black plastic and both have their advantages and disadvantages. It turns out that clear plastic will heat the soil up hotter than black plastic, especially during the hottest months of the summertime. And so it, with that regard, clear plastic might be better, but it allows light to transmit through the plastic. And so black plastic, while it doesn't get as hot, it blocks all the light so that the plants can't photosynthesize. So if it's a little bit cooler, you might want to consider using black plastic. One more idea that you might consider if you have a larger area is it in some and you have some bad patches of perennial weeds is to set aside a fallow area each year. And this can have a couple of different advantages, especially if you plant something perennial like a perennial legume that you can mow over and over again. This will help deplete perennial weeds of their carbon stores and their roots. And it will also add valuable nutrients to your soil. So doing something like this, if you have the room, will help improve your soil and get rid of the weeds. So for example, out at my research site, I planted a mixture of um, Timothy grass, alfalfa and red clover we mow it three times a year and it's cut down on the canada thistle and perennial sow thistle i would say 80 to 90 percent so it's quite effective if you have the ambition to do that okay now we're going to move on to talking about annual weeds Unlike perennial weeds, you will never get rid of annual weeds. The soil is loaded with their seeds. Oftentimes the seeds are very long lived and persistent. And so every year you can count on, no matter what you do, you're gonna count on having annual weeds that can emerge. For instance, in one of my first gardens, I thought that if I kept pulling this common mallow, that grew in my garden prolifically and never let it go to seed, but eventually I'd get rid of it. And I think I pulled it religiously for about eight years and there was never any decline in the common mallow emergence. And the reason is those seeds can live for probably 30 years in the soil. And so with the annual weeds, you're looking at needing to either suppress them or you're going to need to remove them via tillage, hoeing, mowing, or hand pulling. And those things are all the uh, labor intensive approaches. And so I think it's better, again, to prevent these weeds by suppressing their emergence. And one of the best ways to do that is to use cover crops or various mulches to suppress weed emergence and growth. So um, once again, I'm gonna have a little quiz to see how people do on their annual weed ID. Starting on the top left, we have a, a very common annual weed called common lambs quarters. Then um, top right, this is a winter annual called field pennycress. It's one of the first weeds to flower in the spring. On the bottom left is common purslane. Um, this is a weed that is very prolific in gardens, but it's very low growing. And then finally on the bottom right is yellow foxtail. And you may also see green foxtail, which is similar. So that's a little bit of ID for you there. So let's talk a little bit about how to suppress these annual weeds. One way to do it is with a cover crop. And there's a number of different approaches. One way is to try planting fall planted winter rye. And this is a great cover crop for a number of reasons. One is that it helps to hold the nitrogen in the system instead of allowing it to be leached out. Um, nitrogen is very mobile in the soil. And if you just leave your soil bare with no growing plants in the soil, the winter snow is gonna melt and the water will infiltrate through the soil and you'll lose all your nitrogen. Another thing that rye is really great for because it's a grass and it has a fibrous root system, it's really good at breaking up heavy clay soils. And in the meantime, it will suppress weeds. Another idea is to use a legume like sweet clover. That's really great for adding nitrogen to your system. Mustard family plants, 
are really good for getting rid of soil pests. A lot of mustard family plants exude um, glucosinolates that are toxic to soil pests, so they can help with weed suppression and cutting down on soil pests. And then another suggestion is annual buckwheat, which grows really quickly. You could plant that in the spring. And one thing that's neat about buckwheat is it helps to make the soil phosphorus a little bit more available. Uh, something that's kind of an unusual idea is to use weeds as a cover crop or maybe a mulch. So a dense stand of annual weeds can be cut or pulled before those weeds go to seed and just laid on the surface as a mulch. I did this with a garden in Wisconsin once where we uh, were gardening next to a huge patch of giant ragweed and we would use a mower to just cut that ragweed before it went to seed and we'd plant our garden, we'd pile up the ragweed plants everywhere and we would literally plant it on Memorial Day and come back on Labor Day. We never did a thing. We never had to pull a weed. We just planted it, mulched it, came back on Labor Day and harvested it. And so a weed mulch is really great because it's free. It'll suppress your weeds. It'll break down and add nutrients to soil like any other mulch. And then um, we can talk a little bit more about other types of mulches that you might use. Plastic mulch, we've talked about a little bit with regard to perennial weeds. It'll also work fine for annual weeds. You can use clear, black, or even some colored plastic mulches. Sometimes they make a red mulch or a green mulch. Those mulches have sometimes been shown to help certain plants like tomatoes, for example. Some of the advantages are that plastic mulches are relatively inexpensive. They do suppress most annual weeds pretty well. But on the other hand, they don't decompose. They don't improve your soil. And plastic mulches can contribute to plastic waste disposal problems. And I think that's really an important thing to consider. Uh, if you're going to use plastic mulches, I think they work best for crops that are planted as seedlings, like tomatoes, peppers, and squashes, warm season crops, where you can lay that plastic out and then just cut a little hole where you want to drop your seedling in. Um, but besides those crops, I would probably always lean toward using organic mulches like hay straws, leaves, and things like that. Um, usually there's some cost involved except for leaves. Weed suppression can vary a lot. Um, another thing to consider is the carbon nitrogen ratio. So every material has a sort of a characteristic carbon nit nitrogen ratio and you need to consider that. Um, we'll just run through some of these options really quickly. Straw hay is a, a very common mulch material. It needs to be pretty thick. It does decompose relatively quickly and it adds a lot of nutrients to the soil. Hay will add more nutrients than straw. But something you need to watch out for is that um, hay and straw, especially hay, can contain weed seeds. So you need to make sure that the hay isn't loaded with a bunch of weeds. And sometimes these mulches can harbor pests like rodents. And they can sometimes be a little expensive too. Um, wood chips are another option. Uh, they are oftentimes free. I know the landfill here gives them away for free. Two or three inches deep usually can do it. There's some thought that as wood chips decompose, they change the soil biology and shift it more to a woodland type biology with more fungal dominance as opposed to bacteria. Um, like you would see in a grassland, which is what we would want more in vegetable production. Um, they can be coarse. They don't decompose very easily. They're hard to move aside. They might interfere with vegetable seedling emergence. And they also may acidify the soil. They also may rob a little nitrogen from the soil as they can decompose because they have a high carbon nitrogen ratio. And then you also need to be careful with some tree species like black walnut because they contain compounds that are toxic to vegetables. 
tree leaves are another option that I've used a lot because they're free and they do work really well to suppress annual weeds. They can be easily moved around and managed in the garden. One drawback is they tend to form really thick mats that can hold in a lot of moisture. Um, slugs really love leaves mulch so if you have a slug problem i'd probably not go with this one and again leaves have a pretty high carbon nitrogen ratio so you might need to add some extra nitrogen to make up for that newspaper and cardboard are another other materials that are very commonly used in the garden uh, they both also have high carbon nitrogen ratios they work well to suppress weeds, but they can blow around. So they use, usually are anchored down. People will anchor them down by putting some compost on top or maybe some straw or hay. So they don't work as well all by themselves, but they can work well as a base layer that's really um, cohesive and impenetrable. And then you might not need quite as much thickness of hay or straw on top of that. Um, some unusual materials are cocoa bean holes and hemp herd. Um, these are neat materials because they're finer textured and you don't need as much of the material to get good weed suppression. They might be a little bit more expensive. The cocoa bean holes are really beautiful and they add some nutrients to the soil. The hemp herd is an unusual material that's not widely available yet. I just mentioned it because I've done some research with it and it worked really great to suppress weeds, but it did seem to rob some nitrogen from the plants. So the next thing I'm going to try is mixing it with some composted manure to get that nitrogen content up. Okay, so that's enough of mulches. Um, in the last talk, you heard all about starting your own seedlings, and I'm going to make a pitch for that. Any plant that you can start from a seedling and then plant as a seedling and not a seed, that gives your crop a head start on the weeds. And so that's a really great idea that you can utilize not only to save some money, but to get, get a jump on the weeds. And this is just a picture of a little tiny cold frame that I made that I use at home to grow my starts. Uh, finally, the last idea is just to bypass pests that live in the soil altogether. And there's a couple of techniques for doing this. One is called no-till or lasagna gardening. And that's pictured on the left. And what you do there, is, and you can even start a garden like this right on top of grass without even having to kill the grass. And what you would do is lay down some newspaper and then maybe, a, I think there's a layer of brown material like leaves or peat moss and then a layer of green like vegetable um, scraps, yard waste, grass clippings, and then another layer of brown, another layer of green, and then over the top you would add some compost or some composted manure and you just plant directly into that and that way you don't have any weeds at all if your materials that you're using your green and brown layers are weed free and that way if you have a really bad weed problem you can just bypass it all together and it also will help bypass some disease or other soil pest problems that you have in the soil. Another idea is something that a guy named Joel Karsten, who's over in St. Paul, Minnesota, came up with, and I believe he wrote a book about this and gives workshops about it. It's called straw bale gardening. And what you do is you get bales of straw, um, just really briefly, I'm not gonna go through it in detail because we don't have time, but really briefly, you just lay those bales of straw, cut ends up, you water them and you add some fertilizer to help get them decomposing a little bit. And then you put a little compost or manure on the top and plant your crops into it. Once again, that's a really neat trick because you're just bypassing all of the weed seeds that are in the soil. And over time, the straw bales decompose and do help to add nutrients to the soil. And so that is a 
basic rundown of a lot of the ideas I have for making gardening more fun by cutting down on weed problems and not spending so much time on your hands and knees pulling weeds. Um, just to recap, with perennial weeds, I think the best idea is to remove them via digging as much as possible, or you can try suppressing them with heavy mulch, plastic mulch, or potentially using a fallow period with some kind of perennial crop or cover crop that you mow periodically. With the annual weeds, you're always going to have the annual weeds. You need to suppress their emergence by covering the soil. That's really key. We always want that soil covered with cover crops or organic mulches or our crop. Um, plan into clean plots. Consider using starts instead of seeds because this will give your plants a head start on the weeds and also consider using soil free techniques like lasagna gardening or straw bale gardening and that's all I have and I'll be happy to take some questions if you have any thank you thank you <clears throat> we do have several questions here how about let's start with an asparagus planting that has quack grass in it any special tips with that? Oh boy. Well, this is a problem. Asparagus is a tricky crop because it's a perennial crop and over time it's going to become infested with perennial weeds. Um, if you have an asparagus bed that's already heavily infested with quack grass, I think that what I would probably do is start over unfortunately. I, I think that starting over and doing the work ahead of time to get those weeds out of there before you plant and consider maybe um, submerging some kind of barrier around the edges of the plot so that weeds can't encroach in from the sides. You might be able to use say pieces of plywood that you dig into the soil to create a physical barrier around your edges, kind of like edging that you use in your lawn to keep the grass from spreading into the flower beds, but it needs to be just a little bit deeper. Um, I would just start over again. Um, luckily with the quack grass, it's pretty easy to remove, especially if you do it first thing in the spring after the soil thaws when it first has thawed and dried out it tends to be more friable because the action of the freezing and thawing has loosened it a little bit and that's when I would go in and try to pull all those quack roots out of there and just start over again. Uh, once you've already got a bed that's totally infested with it it's going to be really hard to get those weeds out of there without seriously disturbing the asparagus too. Okay, when we use the solarizing treatment, how long do you put down the plastic and at what time of year? Okay, that's a great question. The idea with the solarization is that you pretty much want to leave it in place for a season so that you take advantage of the hottest part of the summer. That's what's going to really kill the weeds. And so I would lay it down as soon as you can get out there in the spring and just devote an area to that process and leave it for an entire season and then come back the next spring and see what happens. I did this once with a really bad patch of Canada thistle, had a garden that was pretty much solid Canada thistle and we just covered it with black, I think we used black plastic for a year and it cut down on it considerably. Um, something to keep in mind, though, is with some of those perennial weeds, they can poke through that black plastic. So make sure you use a heavy gauge of black plastic. And if you start to see weeds poking through there, you might go lay some boards on top of them or try to pull them out a little bit or just clip them off. Because every time you see any green poking through anywhere, that means the plant is photosynthesizing, sending carbon to the roots, and it's perpetuating your problem. Right. How about uh, a lot of gardeners have questions about using grass clippings uh, 
for weed control or for a mulch? Do you have any guidance for that? That can be a good option. One of the problems, one of the good things about grass clippings is that they have a lot of nitrogen. And so they do add a lot of nitrogen to the soil. However, grass does tend to decompose pretty quickly. Um, so it doesn't create a really long lasting barrier to weed emergence. But if you have the clippings, by all means use them. But if you put chemicals on your yard, you cannot use them. And I would especially caution against getting any grass clippings from places that you don't know how they were treated because those residual herbicides can harm your garden plants. Another thing is that if you don't use the herbicides, then maybe your clippings are loaded with dandelion seeds. And that's something that you might not want to be introducing into your garden either. But as long as you've got clean grass clippings that are free of chemical residues and also weed seeds, they make a pretty good mulch that adds nitrogen, but they decompose pretty quickly. Okay, we have a, just maybe a few focused uh, uh, bullet points for a few weeds here. First one is Canada thistle. Any special tip on Canada thistle control? Uh, with Canada thistle, I have gotten rid of it by digging it. So just di the roots are, are pretty tough. They hang together pretty well. Just dig it out carefully and try to remove every little bit of root. And okay. it's pretty easy to eradicate that way. How about wormwood? Any special tip with wormwood? Um, wormwood is something that I have not really dealt with very much in a garden setting. I uh, don't know as much about that one. It doesn't reproduce vegetatively, I don't believe, so just pulling it would probably suffice and you don't have to worry about the roots as much. How about bindweed? Any special tip on bindweed? It's a really Your favorite tough friend. <laughs> uh, with that one, I think that you just need to be very persistent about it. And you might need to learn to live with it a little bit too. It's more difficult to dig up and remove the roots and get rid of it completely because the roots are really fragile and they fragment easily and every little fragment can create a new plant. But I have gotten rid of it by using really heavy mulch. And every time I saw a little emerging shoot, I would pull it to deprive the plant of carbon. How about uh, this, you've inspired someone to try the fall planted rye as a cover crop. So how do we manage this come springtime? Great question. Uh, yeah, you, it's really good to catch that at about the right time in the spring, I would say when the grass is about four to six inches tall. I would get out there with a garden spade or shovel and just flip it over. And it would be really good to wait until the soil is dried out a little bit. So catch it when the soil is just right, flip it over, let it sit for a couple of weeks and it should decompose. And then you'll be able to uh, maybe till it and plant into it. Or sometimes you can just plant into it just like that. Uh, Greta, what's the difference between uh, wood chips and shredded bark? Does that make a difference in your garden situation too? Um, I don't think there's a huge difference. They're both wood products. Um, you know, I think sometimes you have to be careful with the shredded bark because it can be dyed. And I don't think you'd want to use that those dyed materials that are for flower beds and landscaping in a garden. So I think of wood chips as more of a raw product that's just um, chipped wood that's wood that's gone through a chipper, you know, and not so much the bark. There, it, bark is different than wood. Bark is like the outer covering of a tree, right? So I'm talking more right. about wood. Wood. Chips. Okay, I think this is our last question. Uh, good luck. I have a chicken coop with straw as the floor cover. How long does that straw need to sit so it's not too hot before putting it in my garden? 
a really good question. Yeah, that would be a great thing to use on the garden, but you're right that you need to compost it first. So I would put it in a compost heap and turn it just like compost for a season and then wait till that next year to put it on. And that would be a great addition for nutrients. And it might help some with weed suppression too. Do you have a feeling about cypress mulch? I've used cypress mulch in my flower beds, but I do not think that wood chips or any kind of wood product makes a very good mulch in the vegetable garden. You can, I think in pathways, if you wanted to lay down a weed barrier in between, say, raised beds and line that with any kind of bark or wood chips, that would be great. But the problem with wood chips, cypress mulch, any kind of wood project product, those all have very high carbon nitrogen ratios. They rob nitrogen from the soil, which you don't want. Right. How about corn gluten meal for wheat suppression? Corn meal, that has shown some ability to reduce emergence of annual weeds. It's been tested for uses in the yards a little bit. Um, another good thing about it is it does add some nitrogen, but it has a relative, it's relatively short lived. I think it's relatively expensive and it's not something that, that I can highly recommend. It does have some weed suppressive ability, but I don't think that the efficacy really warrants the cost or expense of it. Okay, I think we got all the all the relevant questions answered. So thank you very much. That was very interesting. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. All right. So now, uh, thank you, everybody. We had a great first session. We had over 500 gardeners here tonight learning about gardening. And we're going to keep it going next week. We're going to stay in the garden. We're going to learn about uh, using horticulture as therapy. We'll talk about growing ornamental grasses, and we'll also see what's happening in the North Dakota State University display gardens. And our freebie next week will be some packets of herbs that you can try in your garden. So, so thank you again tonight, and uh, we hope to see you next week. Tell your friends about it. Everybody's welcome to join the forums. Thank you, everybody. Good night.